Welcome. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. Uh, I'm your host, the forum's creator and chief cat herder, Brian Alexander. I'm glad to see you all here today. We have two great guests for a terrific subject. Since the beginning of the Future Trends Forum, we've been tracking the economics of higher education. We've looked at everything from student loans to changing labor conditions. And now I'm so grateful to host two scholars who have written a really, really powerful book. If you look on the bottom left corner of the screen, you'll see a kind of a lozenge colored box or a kind of yellow colored box. And one of the buttons says wealth, cost and price in higher American higher education. That'll take you to a new book by Bruce Kimball and Sarah Eiler. And that book is a wonderful history of how American higher education has been funded. It has a deep dive into endowments, a careful, careful look at how labor and how ex other expenses have changed over time. I can't recommend it highly enough. So if you haven't grabbed a copy, just click on that button. And if you type in four letters, you'll get a special discount from Johns Hopkins University Press. And I'll put those four letters in the chat right now so you can't miss them. Um, now, just rather than talking about them, let me bring them up on stage one by one. So let me begin by finding Sarah and uh, beaming her up on stage. And again, this is the kind of thing where you want to hear Star Trek transporter noise. <laughs> Although, Sarah, from where you are, it might be a Wizard of Oz sound. Are, are you still getting all that wind? Yeah, we sure are. Um, it's died down just a little bit. Still feels like a blustery day, although it's, it's warmer than it's been in the past couple weeks. Well, that's good. That's good. And where are you? Are in North Carolina? I am. I'm uh, just outside of Raleigh in mm -hmm. Wake Forest. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. We, we have a, a tradition on the forum, Sarah, when we ask people to introduce themselves, we ask them not to talk about what they've just done, but what you're planning on doing for the next year. So you know, what are the projects and what are the big ideas that are top of mind for you in the next 12 months? Um, looking at student loan data and other kinds of institutional data. Um, particularly enrollment numbers. I uh, work for one of the UNC institutions. And so um, that's what I've been playing with a lot lately. Um, in oh, excellent. Data. excellent. Did you see Phil Hill's recent piece when he was comparing National Student Clearinghouse and IPEDS enrollment numbers? I did. I did yeah. see that. Um, I thought it was really interesting because, um, you know, in, in institutional research for a lot of people, IPEDS is the gold standard. Yeah. Um, and he talked also a lot about uh, it's the same article that I'm thinking of, common data set. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's very interesting. We're gonna, we, we've hosted the National Student Clearinghouse before, um, and they've been great guests, and we'd love to have iPads on there to talk. I mean, the general shape of their data is similar, but it's still very different. Well, good luck, Sarah. That's crucial research we need to see. Um, and before I ask you any more questions, let me bring your great colleague, uh, Bruce Kimball up on stage to join us too. Hello, Dr. Kimball. Hi, Brian. Thank you very much. Well, it's good to see you. Well, where are you today? Uh, outside Boston, Newton, Newton, Massachusetts. Sure, 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 sure. And uh, just how much snow do you have on the ground? Uh, none, none right now. It's been uh, extraordinary, record setting, uh, late, late wow. snow. Huh. Wow, wow, that's unusual for Boston. Yeah, uh, I, it's been trending that way with the climate change. Exactly, exactly. A major subject of ours. Uh, Bruce, we, you know, I just asked uh, Sarah to introduce herself by looking ahead to the next year. And that's my question for you as well. What are you going to be working on for the next year? What does 2023 hold for you? Well, actually, Sarah and I have been talking about collaborating on another uh, book project that looks at... Um, the decline of the uh, or the capture of the learned so-called learned professions historical learned professions mm. that is clergy lawyers and physicians mm. um, and their capture by essentially market forces um, in the late uh, 20th century and actually and this is news for sarah and i've been thinking about the relationship of that with um, the liberal arts um, mm. because the um, mm. Learned professions were often defined by having a liberal arts education before uh, one went on to high <clears throat> graduate school in, in the learned professions. And those two, liberal arts, have also been captured by market forces. So it's a kind of a book, a project that looks at the relationship between this capture 
by market forces of the learned professions and the liberal arts. Oh, we'd love to see that. We'd love to see that work. Um, just, just to put a bug in your ear, when that project is done, we want to have you back. So you can... <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it takes a long time for these projects to, to develop. <laughs> you just I completely yeah. understand. I completely understand. I'll have the uh, the book launch for my new book uh, actually in about two months. Looking forward to that. Looking oh, forward. looking forward to it. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank That's you. Great. Thank you. Well, oh, I just want to say um, your book is so powerful in so many ways. I mean, one is that it is crammed with data, and yet it is so lucid, so elegantly presented that we just really, at every, at every page, it's clear where you're going. Uh, and you make so many important arguments, like the, the best critique of, of, of uh, uh, Bowen's um, uh, uh, model of, um, I just blanked on the name. Cost um, disease theory? The cost disease, yeah, uh, Bowen's cost disease. Uh, you just, I mean, that's a solid critique. Uh, and also you managed to cover a wide range of history starting in the 19th century and bringing it up to the present. If, if I could, just, just to throw the gates open, um, you, you explain the rising costs as opposed to prices for higher education in terms of this intertwining of rising tuition and other supports, like federal supports, for example, as well as rising costs of operating the uh, institution. And for you, it's a, it's a combination of personnel costs, but also capital costs. And you have this great phrase where these two keep escalating as a kind of helix, a double helix that escalates over time, dragging behind it, uh, rising tuition. Um, how am I doing so far summarizing why cost co why colleges cost so much? Did I nail it or, or you want to bring in some more? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I'll just uh, chime in. I was, you know, the title, why is higher education so expensive? I think. Uh, as we do in the book, a first point is to distinguish two senses of expenses or mm -hmm. two senses of cost. One is the cost of the institutions to produce the education, which economists often call production cost. And we clearly distinguish in the book. The other uh, way cost is used, but we, we call it price in the book, mm -hmm. is what uh, students are paying and their, mm -hmm. and their families are paying. And so those kinds of costs are cost and price, production cost and price, are two very different sort of things. And they are, and I'll just briefly say, it, they are distinguished by subsidies. Mm -hmm. So actually, a, 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 an important factor, and this often gets uh, lost in the public and private uh, public discussion, is that the cost of higher education, that is what it, the production cost, has been subsidized by half, generally by two thirds over the course of the past 130 years. So when we talk about the price that people, that students pay, it's about one third, generally speaking, a broad historical generalization over that uh, time period. So there's very different forces that operate on the two different no. kinds of, uh, of cost and price. Sarah, I add something? Sorry. Yeah, no, so, I, I think that, that that covers what I, that's very comprehensive. I would, uh, I would that actually accurately excuse me captures what we what we set forth in the in the book and i i think that um you know originally when we talked about this idea of the double helix um i was a little uh tentative about it but as we talked about that kind of complex interconnection it it came to make a lot of sense and so i like that as a metaphor it was it was helpful to hold i think in describing this complex interplay because it's very easy, I think, to flatten price and cost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It really is. Especially let me, let me, if I can just pitch in again about the double helix, because I got off on the, the definition of expense and, and cost. So the double helix we talk about in the book, the spiral upward spiraling double he helix, is the idea that since uh, for 130 years, um, colleges and universities have pursued more revenue and wealth, and that has driven more spending. And then the spending requires more revenue and wealth. So that is the double helix. So the other one half of the double helix is cost, but then the other half of the double helix is the spending that uh, and they drive each other upward. Very good. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Um, Bruce, you mentioned subsidies. Are most of these subsidies uh, from uh, governments, both federal and state, or do you also include uh, 
other sources, such as uh, philanthropic donations? Yeah, no, the subsidies include uh, uh, annual gifts, uh, endowment income, um, and uh, local, state, and uh, federal uh, appropriations over time, and also grants and contracts. And each one of those is sort of a different, uh, a different kind of subsidy um, that um, contributes yeah. to covering cost. Very good. Uh, right. Friends, yeah. I have a couple of more questions for our, our, our guests, um, but start revving up your own comments and questions. Again, go to the bottom of the screen and either click the raised hand button if you want to beam up on stage and, and put the question live, or click the question mark and start typing in your question. Uh, by the way, also on the bottom left of the screen, there should be two buttons. One of them is to a really, really nice article by our two authors called Rising Production Cost and Resentment, a topic we're going to get to in, in, in just a bit. Um, I'm, I'm curious about uh, some arguments that you built to by the end. And again, you have such great historical sweep. Like one of my favorite bits is around the 1910s, 1920s, when you have different wealthy institutions competing to use the word democratic in fundraising. Um, you know, we're more democratic. We are the most democratic. It was just, it was brilliant and very funny too. Um, but looking at the present day, you suggest that we're seeing a kind of hardening of hierarchy you know, within American institutions, that we have some institutions that start off in the 1800s and some just after that, that are really kind of cemented in place at the very top of the academic pecking order, uh, and that they have committed everything. You know, at one point you mentioned to, uh, uh, to reputation, that they would do everything for that. In fact, they were like the cookie monster. They will eat all money, all income coming in. Are we, do you think we're really stuck with that, with that kind of frozen elite? Uh, is that where we are now? Bruce? Uh, I think Bruce may have frozen. Uh, so Sarah, you go ahead and answer and uh, I'll, I'll help Bruce out. So one of the things that we talk about in the book is, is how the, the, there's this kind of inertia that develops as the stratification of wealth among these institutions um, becomes increasingly calcified. And so there is this inertia, um, if I understand your question correctly, um, in, in fundraising and spending. Right. There's it's a, it becomes a constant cycle of alumni fundraising campaigns, um, appeals to wealthy donors and um, these fundraising drives. And, and it's incessant. And part of the reason we argue for that is because um, you can never have you can never accumulate enough money to plow back into endowment. You froze, Bruce. Um, yeah, I, I, you all froze. So maybe I froze. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, back, I'm back here. I'm back here. Yeah, I'll vote you. Uh, Sarah, Sarah's probably addressed it. So yes, today, um, that is one of our arguments at the end of the book, that the casts of higher education today um, are sort of uh, etched in stone. It's very difficult for a lower um, a, a uh, institution with less wealth, by which you mean endowment, to rise into an upper caste or upper strata, stratus of, uh, of uh, education. And the reason is because of certain uh, wealth advantages that we identify that have developed over the past 130 years. And I might say, um, Sarah and I published a uh, op-ed piece in the Boston Globe um, and uh, Harvard was used in it. And we got some pushback, I have personally, from a number of Harvard uh, affiliated people who said, but Harvard and these wealthy places, they earn this, they deserve this place. So what you're actually, so critiquing their, their wealth is um, kind of unjustified. But, the, but in the book, we, we um, itemize several, what we call wealth advantages that institutions have developed. And I can just itemize those briefly. One is, which is intuitive, wealthy schools tend to have wealthier alumni. Um, so they give more. But second of all, wealthy schools spend less per dollar raised um, in fundraising than do less wealthy schools. Wealthier schools spend less per dollar raised than less wealthy schools. Third, uh, wealthy schools have greater access to portfolio managers and financiers, mm -hmm. and they pay less, and they can afford the money to pay for those more expert mm -hmm. 
financiers. And actually, scholars in the 1920s already identified those two points as endowments began to stratify. Um, and then uh, uh, another wealth advantage is that the wealthiest institutions, by virtue of the fact that they have larger um, capital, can afford to take more risk. And by taking more risk, you get more return. Risk and return are, are highly correlated. Yes. So as with, per, as with the, in, us as individuals, if you have more capital, you can take more risk. And that, over the long term, guarantees you higher, higher, uh, higher return. And fourth is, I think, uh, beyond that, what Sarah was just alluding to is that wealthiest institutions, and this has been hugely um, a point of controversy, have generally uh, maintained very low spending rates for their endowment, mm -hmm. called the spending rules. So spending rules throughout the last century have generally um, ranged between 4 and 5% of the annual amount spent. But meanwhile, over the... Over the 40 years, from 1974 to 2014, the mean of the average agile, average return on endowments was 12%. So they're earning 12%, and even mm -hmm. if you have for inflation and management fees, you're spending 4%, mm -hmm. well, you have another 4% left over to plow back into your endowment. So that means a larger endowment grows more, it has a higher rate of return and a larger base, so it returns more. And then finally, if, um, if a wealthy institution stumbles, as Harvard did during the Great Recession, mm -hmm. they can afford to borrow, issue bonds, as Harvard did in the Great Recession, of $2.5 billion to bail themselves out so they don't have to sell depreciated assets in the short term. But lesser, uh, less endowed or, or unendowed institutions, particularly HBCUs, pay higher underwriting costs and have greater trouble accessing the, uh, the bond market. So, uh, so that's the uh, final wealth advantage, you might say. Wow. Wow. And that really hardens that, that cast shell. So they, they're in great shape. Um, friends, I have so many questions, but I, I'm, I'm going to defer to you all now. Um, you, you can see why I'm a big fan of these two authors in this book, because there's so much going on. Uh, our, and let me bring up a, a, a few of these text questions. And the first one's from Lee Nichols. Uh, and let's see here. Lee Nichols asks, what effect, if any, do you think there's been on price due to the increased availability of financial aid, scholarship, Pell Grant, etc.? Sarah, do you want to address Yeah, that? so... Um... So I think what you see, especially mid 20th century, is um, an explosion of all different kinds of an influx of cash from the federal government in the form of financial aid. And so in the midst of that, tuitions could could fluctuate without families or Americans necessarily feeling the crunch. Um, it, it may have um, increased propensity for tuition, although I think now it's kind of leveled out. I don't think colleges increase their tuition because of increased financial aid. What, what actually I think happens is, you know, they give one price as a list price and then discount that tuition so that students aren't necessarily paying that using right. sub internal subsidies like scholarships or other forms of discounts. And those um, discounts are really steep. And, and Bruce, I'm sure you have Please. more you'd like to add. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, behind the question, I'm, I, I don't know Lee Nichols, but uh, some have suggested that it is the federal grants or other grants, uh, financial aid, that drives up the, uh, the tuition price. Now, actually, economists such as uh, Michael McPherson, who was the former mm -hmm. president of the Spencer Foundation, have, have studied that issue and, uh, and concluded that there's no uh, causal relationship between those, although although there is uh, there is a correlation, um, mm -hmm. certainly, and um, there is a uh, body of economic thinking um, propounded by Howard Bowen, economist Howard Bowen, different from William Bowen, Howard Bowen in 1980, who argued that more revenue drives more uh, uh, more uh, production mm -hmm. cost. Yeah, sure. um, as to whether it actually drives tuition, 
um, is difficult to determine because, as I said, there's this issue of subsidies. Um, so, it's, so um, in other words, the rising federal or state uh, government appropriations, there is a strong argument, and I, I tend to favor it, that it drives up spending. It drives up uh, production cost, but not hmm. necessarily price. Um, so, so those are, as I said, two quite, quite different things. And the economic research that I've read, uh, mm -hmm. the book I've read, uh, would suggest that there's not a driving force there of financial aid policies. Oh, thank you both. Lee, that was a great question. And it sounds like the Bennett hypothesis there. And thank you both, Sarah and Bruce, for terrific answers. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, that's an example of a text question. Now, let me give you an example of a video question because a uh, very nice Paul Cook offered to ask his question on stage. So let me bring him up. Hello, Paul. Hi, everyone. This is my first time on stage. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, welcome. welcome. Um, so first of all, let me just say this is fascinating. Excellent conversation. And I, I look forward to reading the, hmm. the book. Um, so given this kind of calcified caste system and how hard it is for institutions to break into that, how do you explain what I think is a fact, or at least a trend, that so many institutions are aspirational? They're trying to be the next Harvard, or if not the next Harvard, then you know the next University of Michigan, right? Um, and I'm thinking here specifically of a book that came out about a decade ago by Gay Tuchman called Wanna Be You, where she makes mm. this argument very well that so many institutions have this kind of, they wanna be, these other kinds of higher caste uh, institutions. How do you explain what seems to be kind of a paradox there, or at least a contradiction? Well, th thank you. That's a, that's a great question, Paul. And actually, at the end of the book, we just say, yeah, it's a stupid paradox. <laughs> it's, part of the, it's part of the cultural drive. It's part of the ideology of higher education that we argue in the book was begun over a century ago that um, a way to increase your quality is to compete for more money. And yet we've gotten due to these wealth advantages historically to a point where you can't actually improve yourself. So you have all of these um, institutions continuing to pursue these financial metrics, but they really can't get anywhere except for extraordinary circumstances like Grinnell College in Iowa that uh, Warren Buffett, you know, a sort of catapulted. Is, is, is kind of an exception of this calcified uh, caste, um, as, you, as you said. And so, the, um, and so at the end of the book, we, we argue that we, uh, for a chain where our proposal, perhaps naive, perhaps laughable, um, is a, a change in ethic, a new financial strategy, as it were, in higher education is the only thing that can unlock this because government responses, the federal government responses like the TCJA Act, where they tax the excise, the uh, slapped an ex, uh, punitive uh, excise tax on endowments, or uh, there's talk of rescinding the, um, uh, the uh, tax benefits of higher education. Those are not going to solve the fundamental problem. If the fundamental problem, as we, as we argue, is this competition among institutions um, to try to advance themselves by acquiring more revenue um, and, uh, and wealth. You know, I, should, I just want to throw in here, I'm sorry, Sarah, I'll just, is we talk about the AAU and I, I have, a, you know, I've uh, spent most of my career in AA in uh, Association of American Research One Universities. And I talked to my colleagues, I'm retired now, but there's so much pressure in the top research one universities among department chairs, to go back to your future conference, to generate more money, generate more fundraising, generate more grants. It's like they're doing it to themselves. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to weigh in here? So, so I was going to just um, bring in a historical corollary that we do talk about in the book. And it's, it's some of what I think we see is a holdover from the Gilded Age social Darwinism where money was a hallmark of fitness, right? It is just a kind of revival in a sense, a, a tech age revival of this idea that whoever has the most money is the best because for some reason 
um, financial resources are an arbiter of quality. And so, um, and so I think, I think some of the calcification is due to that kind of that, um, I don't want to say rigidity in thinking, but, but, a a, um, clinging to that kind of idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, both. Oh, oh, great. I mean, it's a great observation. Great right? It's a total paradox, but it's a dysfunctional. It's a, it's a paradox of dysfunction yeah. <laughs> in higher it education. Is. It is. Thank, thank you so much, Paul, and, and welcome aboard. Glad to see you. Um, again, friends, that's a video question. We've got another one coming up. And if you want to follow in Paul's great footsteps, just press the raised hand button and we'll beam you up when it's time. Um, speaking of which, we have a question from our good friend, uh, former guest, uh, wonderful writer, Steve Ehrman. Let me bring him up on stage from Maryland, I think. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing well, Brian. Thanks. Yeah, I'm in Silver Spring, Maryland right now. Good to see you. Good to see um, you. So um, I've written a book which sort of overlaps a little and complements maybe even more um, the work that you two have been describing. Um, and one of the things where maybe I've added something useful um, is to take a look at that, um, uh, the revenue theory of costs from a different angle uh, to observe that it, it also implies that if there is the will and pressure, um, spending can be reduced. You know, if you're the, one of the, one of the things that adds to the, um, just how serious that cost disease is, is that when people are isolated in their own institutions, they tend to believe that anything that's been true for the last five or 10 years is universally true. Um, you know, you need to do X in this particular way at that particular cost. And if somebody else seems to be spending more money, they've got to be wasting some of it. Uh, and if someone else wants to do this with a little less money, uh, they're bound to fail because you can't do it. But uh, what he proved was that there is no production function in that sense in higher education. There are um, all kinds of ways to be good, all kinds of ways to be bad when it comes to um, spending. Um, and I, for me, it kind of links up with um, um, Parkinson's law. Work expands to fill the time available. Yeah. is very closely related to spending expands to fill the revenue available. And it sort of shows us what we're up against. We really can um, potentially do things that improve quality while also controlling costs. Um, and the mo most important part of controlling costs is reallocation from this part of the institution to that part of the institution um, without somehow running into this hard barrier that says, well, you just can't afford that. Uh, we can't. Now, there are limits somewhere, but they they aren't anywhere close to where people usually think they are. Um, so, anyway, I hope that's uh, I hope that's helpful. Yes, th thank you very much, Steve. And I I have to say I I know we drew on some of your your work. I've um, I, your name is familiar uh, to me, and I've seen uh, publications, and they've they've in, in, informed that I, I I can't think of the work right off the top of my head or articles that we relied on. Anyway, we mm -hmm. so we do uh, address um, uh, Howard Bowen's uh, uh, revenue theory of cost uh, quite extensively um, mm -hmm. in the book, um, and uh, in fact, actually, we argue that it. Um, we sort of what we regard as clarify and elaborate the theory um, because his book, his revenue theory of cost, which is very famous, is described in about seven pages in the first chapter of the book. And if you go through the book, um, the other uh, nine tenths of the book, he doesn't even relate to his theory. So you, if you read the book, you, uh, most people read the first chapter and, and draw on that, but he has mm -hmm. <laughs> he, well, he has extensive data and actually mm -hmm. qualifications and emendations of the theory and even a kind of, we argue, reconciliation with cost disease theory. He kind of incorporates it in a way, um, but he only refers to his theory two other passing times in the rest of the book. Anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're but we uh, uh, we are very favor uh, uh, favor that. What I wanted to pick up on was your point, which I think is very well taken, about um, 
spending money within a silo of an institution. It's very hard to spend it elsewhere. Um, and I would broaden that because, as we suggest at the end of the book, um, this change to the sort of competitive ethic, if you will, that Paul Cook, uh, we talked about with Paul, Paul Cook, we talk about a, a collaborative model um, urging a collaboration outside of institutions. So it'd be like not only within the silos of an institution, which I totally agree with you, but also a kind of sharing of uh, wealth advantages across uh, institutions to strengthen higher education overall, because higher education has lost so much esteem and political support over the last 40 years, which we document in the book. <clears throat> and that's an important uh, effect of these wealth problems. So higher education has lost public esteem, lost political support, and that's a result of this, of this uh, uh, dysfunctional paradox um, uh, referenced by Howard Bowen's uh, revenue, uh, revenue cost theory. Sarah, do you want to weigh in? I... No, I think that, I think you, you covered what I was going to, what I was going to say. But That's I would, I would second what Bruce said about about your work and and us um, encountering it and, and using it as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Steve. Thank, thank you so much for, for coming back, and uh, I hope you I hope you stay warm uh, <laughs> and dry. Uh, we have um, we have some more questions uh, in the queue, and I want to get, make sure everyone gets a chance to ask them. Uh, and this is a really interesting question that has come from, uh, let me bring up here. Um, this is from uh, Joseph Robert Shaw. What happens to the conversation if we only look at public universities and leave private universities out of the cost and price question? <laughs> well, um, the decline in government subsidies over the last uh, 40 years, and what I should say, I should clarify this, it's a decline in the proportion that government subsidies uh, uh, cover the total production cost of higher education. Because actually, the subsidies have increased in, uh, but not increased uh, as fast as the production cost has grown. Mm -hmm. And this decline in government appropriations has largely impacted public universities more than private universities for, for obvious uh, reasons. And economists, um, again, such as uh, Michael McPherson, um, Ron Ehrenberg, have um, studied this and in, in several books. And the aphorism uh, that cited is, is often a, a, a shift from the burden of paying for education from, ta from the taxpayers mm -hmm. to the individual student. And that has been a story of higher education, uh, certainly over the last two decades, and and uh, and even uh, it actually goes back to uh, the Reagan's presidency in 1980, when uh, David Stockman, his uh, financial advisor, said very memorably, um, "Students have uh, if students want to go to higher education, want to go to college, they can find the resources to uh, to, to pay for it." So that was a, a great shift in ideology of, of uh, public government support uh, for higher education. So that's uh, the, the decline of government appropriations has a, had a huge impact on the public universities. Uh, uh, Sarah, do you want to um, follow up with that? Um, so I, I also think what we see alongside a decline in subsidies is a, um, to Bruce's point where he's talking about uh, David Stockman and the Reagan administration, we see um, an increased popularization and increased acceptance of not just um, hyper individualism or the individual as the center of public life, but we also see next to that um, an embrace of anti tax rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so as taxes declined, subsidies also were impacted. And, and I think public institutions were, were especially hard hit. Let me just follow up on that, if I may. Is that a, a segue to the debt problem, which we, which we do not, um, we touch on in, in, at the end of the book and have written uh, other pieces on. Um, but the, the um, um, among undergraduates who attended nonprofit institutions, 
Okay, mm -hmm. let me talk first. In debt, over half of the debt of $1.6 trillion is dropped year about um, is debt by graduate students, including mm -hmm. medical law and business students. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of bracket them. There are different forces driving why they went into debt and the return they may get on. There's about another quarter of the debt that comes from for-profit institutions, which we uh, do not address in the book and frankly is a cesspool. Um, and um, uh, I apologize if anyone's here. <laughs> okay, so what we're talking about with, un with undergraduate debt at Nonprofit institutions, which you focus on, it's about a quarter of the total debt. And most of that debt that's borne by students who cannot afford to repay comes yeah. from students who attended public institutions that are little endowed and do not have the resources to mm. support their students. That's where the great mm. source of problematic uh, student debt arises, in our opinion. It's a problem that understood as undergraduates at nonprofit institutions. Um, and, um, and so this goes back to the question about the subsidies. So the declining proportion of subsidies that results in higher tuition prices at public institutions is connected to the student debt in that respect. In that respect of students, largely from the middle and working classes, um, who attended public institutions that have little, relatively little endowment or um, or no endowment? I saw this. I was trying to connect the issue of the uh, sub of the public appropriations and yeah. the public institutions. Well, between the two of you, that's a great set of answers uh, to the terrific question. Uh, thank you so much. We have more questions coming on in, uh, and I want to make sure that we get as many of these as we can. Uh, this is a video question from Gregory Shuckman. Let me bring him on stage. I think he's audio only right now, but let me just give him a shot. Hello, Greg. Oh, audio and, but actually no audio. Okay, um, no problem. I can ask the question for him. He wants to know if we had discussed the Shiva Regal effect. Um, and um, I just that was a big smile from you, Sarah. Do you want do you want to give that a, a, a quick answer? Well, or? I it's one of my it's just one of those turns of phrase that I really love. That that was my grand the the, the idea that um, you know your your lower end alcohol brands are trying to be um, the the highest end or your top shelf. Um, I, I we do talk about in the book um, a kind of. Uh, Trying to find the right words uh the tendency of uh lower tier schools to emulate the practices of the higher tier schools particularly in terms of fundraising um in another um work that that bruce did on his history of harvard law school he calls it isomorphism which which is also uh -huh. you know similar here right like the tendencies and the practices that are so successful for harvard you know state schools want to emulate that lower tier private schools want to emulate that and so, um, so I do think if, if that's what we mean by Shiva Regal effect, yeah, there is some of that. Um, although I think now the inertia, I, you know, it, it started probably in the late 19th, early 20th century, and now it's just become part of the fabric. We don't even necessarily realize that that's what we're seeing anymore. Yeah, actually, and Sarah taught me the Shiva Regal effect. She, came, she uh, <laughs> brought that term we were taught when we were talking about this. Um, and I would just, I would distinguish two kinds of uh, chivalrical effect. One is intuition, which largely operates in the private sector, which is to say that tuition increases in the private sector of higher education, and this is widely acknowledged, are driven by the wealthiest institutions. And they're driven by the wealthiest institutions because when Princeton raises its tuition to $50,000 a year, less endowed institutions want to try to raise, raise their tuition up that much because mm -hmm. it makes them uh, it gives a sense like buying a higher quality car or better whiskey right that mm -hmm. it's as good mm -hmm. as the higher product the problem there is you run into tuition discounts so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. since the, uh, tuition discounting started a little bit in the 1970s and then expanded in the 1980s and then just went rampant in the 1990s and early 21st century. Um, 
to the point where as of 2009 at uh, private institutions, students were paying 45% of the list price um, overall when you, when you in, incorporated financial aid and also tuition discounting policies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the reaction to that, as we've recently seen, if you saw the story in I think Washington Post or whatever about Colby Sawyer College in New Hampshire, very significantly um, mm -hmm. exemplified a trend where they cut their tuition dramatically from I think close to 45,000 down to 17,000. They just cut it because the tuition discounting got so bad <laughs> that the price tag, list price w was uh, preventing students from enrolling. So there's a kind of obverse uh, or converse uh, phenomenon. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to go too on, but the other Chivas Revolt effect um, ramifies into public institutions in the sense that the privates or, or higher tier, um, they um, introduce ancillary programs and amenities mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. all of higher education institutions need um, in order to attract students, salad bars, uh, dorms, uh, you know, career offices, whatever. Indoor um, pools. Swimming pools, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. We we have uh, it's it's a it's a great topic, and uh, I'm glad that we've gotten into the uh, Urban Dictionary part of, uh, of, of the program. Um, uh, let, let me see if, I, if I, let me see if I can get uh, if I can get Gregory on audio. Greg, um, is your uh, mic on? Looks like it. It can you hear me, Brian? Yes, perfectly. Very good. Sorry, sorry about that. It's so, okay. Um, so. The discussion about Bowen's law um, happened to mm -hmm. be one of the questions that was asked for my qualifying exam. So I spent oh. a fair amount of time looking at it and um, yeah. just wanted to expand on it and, and get your, your feel for it, uh, especially since you were talking about working with R1 universities. But um, I don't know if you came across a, a few of these quotes, but um, Ron Ehrenberg, the former VP yes. uh, for planning and budgeting at Cornell, um, said that um, talking about the pursuit of status and prestige, he said the institutional leaders are engaged in the equivalent of an arms race of spending to improve its mm -hmm. absolute quality and to try to improve its relative stature in the prestige pecking order. And then that sort of built on what Charles Elliott, who was the president of Harvard said back in 1906. Oh, you've got to read our book. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. Okay. So, so, so I haven't read your book yet, and I'm looking forward to reading. No, it. I'm just kidding. I'm just. Kidding. <laughs> but um, for those who hadn't read the book, Elliot Elliot said back in 1906, he said the in the competition between American universities and between American and foreign universities, those universities will inevitably win, which have the largest amount of free money. So, in 1906, the president of Harvard was making this argument. What's changed in? <laughs> In 117 years. Well, uh, David, you should you should have written the book because uh, Greg, <laughs> I'm sorry, Greg, uh, because actually we we all, every quote you've made <laughs> is in our book, <laughs> and we argue that actually how Howard Bowen's uh, revenue cost theory um, identified in 1980, he never talks about the historical origins of it, nor nor do other commentators about it. And we argue in the book that the roots, the origins of the of the phenomenon that Bowen, Howard Bowen described as revenue theory of cost comes from Charles Eliot's uh, free money strategy um, in the uh, in the 1890s. And that it, pro it proliferates from there, um, partly due, due to the uh, first national fundraising campaign in higher education, which was run by Harvard University between 1915 and 1925 and adopted the quote of Eliot's quote that you just quoted as its motto. And so it, this uh, strategy of pursuing free money by which he meant unrestricted endowment um, and wealth, which we define as wealth, uh, proliferates uh, throughout uh, higher education uh, from there. And actually also the Ehrenberg quote, we also quote in the book. So you should have written the book, Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> Is, is it too late to get uh, I wrote this. It's a great point because in the book, we talk about the influence of the cost disease theory of, of uh, William Bowen, 
economist at Princeton who who established the theory, cited the theory in 19, in 1968, and Howard Bowen's revenue theory of cost, which was expressed in 1980. And those compete for influence in higher education in the subsequent decades. And so Aaron Berg's often noted book that he published in 2000 cites, as, as you say, exactly the revenue theory of cost of Howard Bowen. But in that book, Aaron Berg never cites, never cites Howard Bowen. At hmm. the same time that he pays, th puts, uh, devotes three pages of attention to describing William Bowen's cost disease theory. Hmm. Why is that? The reason we argue is because William Bowen, the economist from Princeton, his cost disease theory had great deference among economists. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you get to Ron Ehrenberg in 2000, who is an economist, they sort of have to tip their cap, tip their cap to William Bowen. But actually what their actual interpretation of higher education fits with Howard Bowen's revenue theory of cost. And this continues in other economies. Mm -hmm. Brian, can I ask uh, just a very quick follow-up? Please, please go ahead. Gregory. So what I found really curious, I'm, I'm curious to get your take on it. So Bowen, Harold Bowen, published this revenue theory back in 1980. U.S. News comes out with their first rankings in 1983. Do you think that mm. that prompted mm. the creation of the whole rankings industry? Um, well, um, uh, we argue in the book, the first ranking of endowments to focus on that of wealth was issued in May, 1970 by the Chronicle of Higher Education. The first time the Chronicle issued its famous annual listing, rank listing of endowments was in May, 1970. Um, and we argued that that is a, uh, is a turning point. And then Nakubo, the National Association of College Business Officers and whatever, um, mm -hmm. began ranking endowments in 1974. And mm -hmm. the Chronicle of Higher Education started using the Nakubo data, which is the standard in the you know in higher education that others rely on. And so we would point rather than to 1983, although your point is well taken about the rankings, but the core of the importance of wealth ranking related to academic quality begins with the Chronicle of Higher Education in 1970. Um, and the U.S. News and World Report is kind of a piggyback on that, if you will. Thank you. An influential good, itself, certainly. Good question, Gregory. And thank you for persisting through um, um, to ask really, really solid, good stuff. Um, and uh, thank you both, Bruce and, uh, and Sarah, for really, really thoughtful answers. We're getting a lot of information here, but we are coming up on the end of the hour and I wanna make sure everyone gets a chance to, uh, to, to ask the questions. Uh, Mark has been very patient. Let me bring him up on stage. Uh, hello, Mark. Great, thank you. First time. Um, Welcome. Uh, this is fascinating. Wow. I, I appreciate this. And I'm wondering with all the research and, and I'm no expert in this, um, I've been in higher ed for 22 years, but for 15 years, I've chaired um, the student committee that oversees student fees. And what I'm wondering from your research or anything that you're aware of, when we think about economics, right? I, I, I took two econ classes and learned about supply and demand. And what I'm wondering is, how do we get students to understand that they have power in this and that, so for example, at the last institution I worked at for 15 years, 40% of the students were Pell eligible. Uh -huh. When you sat down and talked to them about what they wanted in their next residence hall, guess what they all wanted? Uh -huh. Separate rooms, separate bathrooms, high-end amenities, organic food, local food, right? You, we all could probably write the list. Sure. Well, guess what that does to your cost of education? Right. And yeah. So I guess that's what I'm wondering, like, how do we engage students in this level of discussion? So it's not just about, well, this is what accreditors do and this is what the federal and state governments, but that students, hey, there's 16 million of you and you're making choices that impact what you're paying. 
And I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That's uh, th that's very well said. Um, toward, the, toward the end of our book, when we're talking about the uh, emergence of student debt, I, I described before about the, um, uh, the relation of student debt to subsidies. Um, but it's important to understand that the net price, that is tuition and academic fees that go to the academic enterprise, largely remained level from 2006 to 2016, virtually level. And you can see this in, in college board pricing studies that they did, okay? So what drove the price overall was the, what we call ancillary fees. That is room, board, uh, travel, uh, entertainment, recreation centers, okay, and so forth. So um, the, the, you're absolutely right. It's, it's the student, or it's the desire for this, as it were, um, and the institutions willing to cater to it that has driven up the debt because it's driven up the price, but it's the price of the ancillary expenses, mm. not the actual the price of, of academic tuition fees. So and I, I, yeah. I think it's I think it's hard to to explain to students um, that um, you know universities have used things like well like advanced wellness centers and indoor pools and water slides like those are selling tools right so they're a way for you to come to that institution. I don't, I don't know that, um, I think they'd have a hard time separating the fact of like, oh, this sounds really exciting. These dorms are so much nicer than this other, you know, institution's dorms. I'm going to go with the other institution's dorms because like, I don't think they make the connection between um, those amenities and the, the, the extravagance or quality of those amenities and the size of their fees. So I would say if you can show them those numbers if you can show them that data maybe they'd be more inclined to to um to let it go but um i think in part because it's a it's a comp there's a, mar a competition a marketplace competition mm -hmm. for students especially amid declining enrollments it's hard for universities and institutions to let go of those amenities that drive up ancillary fees and even, even let me say in addition to amenities i mean there are things that have grown enormously over the last 40 years, such as uh, career advising centers. Uh -huh. Now, uh -huh. probably everyone, uh, parents uh, think, well, you got, or students, I mean, what could be more necessary at a college or university than a career advising center? Um, but those, are, those have grown in, in tremendously and often first term freshmen, my son went to the University of Rochester and the first semester of, of um, uh, of his freshman year, the career advising center was come on in and we'll get you an internships and help you find mm -hmm. a job. Mm -hmm. So is that really necessary? Is that a function? Uh, is that a necessary function of a college university? I don't know. You could argue it either ways. But those centers now, as I'm sure everyone in the audience and uh, here knows, have they have great numbers of staff. Um, I went to Dartmouth mm -hmm. College in 1970 and 1970s. And the Career Advising Center was it was a little room and had a secretary in it and, and leaflets all around the room. <laughs> There's a pamphlet for that. What? There's yeah, a pamphlet that, for that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not saying maybe you don't know. Well, you know, maybe that was underprepared, but uh, that was an Ivy League school. So these kinds of um, staff increases, non-instruction yeah. staff increases have, have contributed enormously. I think that's a really good point because as the the infrastructure of universities have expanded to cater to to all variety all manner of student needs, um, that's also driven up those kinds of indirect production costs, for lack of a, a better description. Right, the administrative costs that don't necessarily pay for the textbooks or the teacher in the classroom, but all of the other things that make the institution as a whole run. Well, that's a great, great set of answers. Mark, thank you for the great question. Um, and, and friends, I, I hate to say this, but we're out of time. And it's the, it's the top of the next hour. And Sarah, Bruce, you've been fantastic. Uh, let me ask, how can we keep up with the two of you and, and your new research and your new work? What's the best way? 
Um, <laughs> well, happy to have you email me. Um, but uh, uh, we we are continue to try to write. We're um, uh, I've given a couple Zoom lectures. I have a Zoom lecture scheduled in the middle of February um, for a, a re retired faculty group. Uh, so we'll continue to try to um, uh, be uh, uh, I don't know be be assessed. We'd love to hear from anyone. Yeah. Who, would be interested in communicating with us about this, or are you glad to speak to uh, to people uh, as well? Great. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I usually post mm -hmm. things that we're publishing on on mm -hmm. that that place. Um, and again, um, I, I welcome, like Bruce said, emails um, and and any kind of conversation. I'm always happy to engage in that. We do have yeah. another uh, another um, yes. online article coming out in Inside Higher Education. Um, in a couple of weeks about this solution aspect to some of these problems, which you've oh, alluded great. Please uh, let me know when that's live so I can share it as well. Thank you very much. Bruce Kimball, Sarah Myler, thank you so much for this, uh, for this conversation. Much appreciated. And good luck with your new research. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all for, for, for sharing your time with us. But don't go away, friends. Uh, let me just point out where things are headed next. If you want to keep talking about this kind of, uh, these topics about uh, college cost and college price, please uh, over on Twitter, use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events. You can find me at Mastodon. There's the link there. Or my blog, brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to look back into our archive for previous sessions talking about this topic, just go to tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. Uh, if you want to see some sessions coming up, we have a whole set of them for the next two months. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. And if you have anything that you've been working on that you'd like to share, please email me so I can share it with the community. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for your great questions, everybody. This has been a terrific discussion. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well. I hope you're staying warm where you need to stay warm and you're staying dry where you need to stay dry. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.